okay so this is uh, lecture 23 <coughs> okay so we saw quite a few things in the previous lecture okay and a lot of uh, interesting new things which are uh, which are quite crucial in understanding why ldpc codes work in practice okay towards the very end i showed you a plot okay so maybe i'll insert that here it's a picture Okay, so this picture looks quite big. Okay, so then at the end of the day, after everything has been said and done with all these analysis and thresholds and all that, finally this picture is very crucial. Okay, so you should be convinced about the performance of LDPC codes immediately after seeing this picture. Okay, so you can go back and work with a lot of these things like thresholds and all that, and finally. that's very important that you know all that but at the end of the day this is the picture which justifies ldpc codes okay so for instance we have this wonderful threshold analysis which is based on this iid assumption which is based on the tree like neighborhood or no cycle cycle free neighborhood up to depth l okay so here i have codes of block length 30 100 1000 1000 okay and i have constructed them okay i have constructed so that there are no length 4 cycles okay so i have taken care to remove length 4 cycles and each and every one of these parity check matrices has a lot of length 6 cycles okay they have quite a few well, let me not say lot they have quite a few length 6 cycles okay so what does it mean moment i say there are length 6 cycles length 8 cycles up to what iteration do you have iid assumption being valid okay Only up to two iterations, right? So third iteration onwards, you will start having problems with your IID assumption. Okay, but still, what happens here? Okay, what happens here? In spite of the fact that you have violations of the IID assumption at the beginning with the third iteration, I do, I'm doing ten iterations here, and the performance seems to track the threshold very closely. <coughs> okay. so so that is pretty much the state of knowledge today as far as analysis of ldpc codes we know that threshold analysis is valid only under the iid assumption which requires cycle free graphs if i have 10 if i'm doing 10 iterations for the analysis to be accurate minimum length cycle should be 22 or so okay otherwise i can't talk about threshold being a valid uh, thing okay but what am i saying in practice i'm saying in practice that even if there are several length 6 cycles i can do iterations up to 10 and threshold is still meaningful okay so if you come up with a theory to extend the threshold analysis with cycles you will become very very popular okay so it's considered a very non trivial thing to do but you can always draw I mean do simulation plots like this and justify uh, why this is uh, very useful okay i'm sorry no this plot the x axis is transition probability okay so as you move to the left the transition probability becomes better so to the right of the threshold you have very poor br performance and to the left of the threshold so it falls down not really no oh you have to see if it's worse than the input transition probability no? not not necessarily the threshold the input probability yeah it could be okay so 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 what's the what's the moral of the story at the end of the day threshold analysis is very useful even in very practical scenarios even when you cannot guarantee that the iid assumption holds threshold analysis is still useful maybe one day somebody will show why it is useful okay but for now we can accept that it is useful even when the iid assumption breaks down okay so that's uh, the first point and uh, the next thing is uh, I, i thought i'll be able to show you a a nice uh, animation i thought i had saved it in e512 it looks like this folder doesn't have it or maybe it has okay let me see okay it's there 
So I'm going to show you an animation. Hopefully it will work. Okay, so I have, to, I have to explain quite a few things. Can you see it large enough? Okay, maybe I'll blow it up a little bit. I'm sorry? Okay, but that's, that's good enough, right? You can see what the animation is, okay? So this is, okay, I have to, I have to explain quite a few things before I launch into this. So far, we've been discussing the uh, decoder from a graph point of view, okay? Right, we've, all, we've always described the messages as flowing from bit nodes to check node or check node to bit node on the edge. Okay, what does an edge correspond to in the matrix? The ones. Okay, so I can imagine at any iteration in step A, okay, there are a bunch of messages that are flowing along the edges. I can imagine that as a matrix. Okay, matrix, a sparse matrix with the messages being put on the non zero positions of my original parity check matrix. Okay. <coughs> Okay, maybe this is a little difficult for you to imagine, but let me start with very simple things first. Okay, so this is the 30, 15 parity check matrix that I've put up here. So what do I mean by saying this is the matrix? Okay, so remember, yeah. Okay, so I guess it's clear to you. Okay, so it's got 30 columns and 15 rows, and what do the what are the green blocks? The green block represents a one. Okay, black means it's zero. Okay, so in the graph, the green blocks represent edges okay so in step a of iteration 1 i'll put values on these green blocks what values will i put on these green blocks the actual messages that are flowing on the corresponding edge okay for instance from the channel what do you receive you receive 30 bits okay each of those bits i can associate with each column what will happen in step a of iteration 1 all the messages <coughs> will flow on, on that column okay so you'll see I've assumed all zero code word okay and my probability of error is quite low so you'll have very few errors in each out of the channel okay and what I'm going to do here is so you can read if you can read the title it says block one output after iteration two okay so I'm going to backtrack a little bit okay so this is not going to allow me to backtrack huh? how do I backtrack with this okay so clearly you guys are better at Windows Media Player than I am okay so then what do I do it's not changing I have to play it but I want to stop immediately at the first frame okay no but it's going oh my god <laughs> it's gone third button from the left no it won't play how do I play it slowly is it possible Okay, anyway, so let me try to be very quick with my play and pause. Okay. Okay, but somehow it's gone to iteration 1. Okay, I want to... Okay, so I guess it's not too bad, but this is not the thing I want. There is one more frame before this. Okay, so I think the quick time player is better. Do we have quick time player on this? No? It's a problem with these Windows things. There should be something, no? That will play it frame by frame or something. Play speed. Okay. Okay. So maybe this is not a good... Uh, Okay, so this is the plot I wanted. Okay, so I've, I've called it iteration 0, block 2. So when I say block 2, it's a fresh block that comes out of the channel. So each block is 30 bits, right? My code word length is 30 bits. So I took 30 bits out of the channel. Okay, what happens in step A of iteration 1? Okay, I've called it iteration 0. What happens? What are the messages that are flowing from the bit nodes to the check nodes? Okay, so you see, from here you can easily figure out how many bits were in error out of the channel. <coughs> Two bits were an error, right? So what so what is red now? Red is one, green is zero. Okay. So this is what is it clear? Okay, reasonably. No, you can't you can't see what's going on. Okay. I'm sorry. Why are? Because it's 
Okay. 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 Okay
so i'll try to upload this uh, animation also on the website maybe then if you have a better media player you can you can uh, play it frame by frame and see how it works out okay so but roughly the idea is clear right so this is how this is how the 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 messages would actually look okay so it's difficult to do it uh, in class take a 30 by 15 matrix and fully do it run it for you stuff okay for each solomon decoding and all we can do it but for these kind of decoders it's difficult to do okay you want the code <laughs> uh, well, let me well, i have some ideas about that we'll see <laughs> okay so how do i get back okay this is not what i want I want this Oh. Shit. This is terrible. I want that bottom thing to come. I don't know how to make it up here. Okay, anyway. This is too complicated for me. Man. Uh, no, simple people don't like simple programs anymore. <laughs> Definitely complicated programs. Anyway. So, okay, so so what what am I trying to say? so so for a very large block length okay when you are actually even running a simple algorithm like gallagher a all kinds of things will happen and and uh, things like what you observed when people are making remarks like yesterday that you may never converge right it will keep on going on and on and you saw that happen quite a bit okay some very strange things can also be observed there'll be very really very few instances when you will converge to the wrong code word in fact i've done simulations for so long with ldpc codes i've rarely ever seen unless i designed i picked a real bad uh, code from the ensemble i'll hardly ever see convergence to a wrong code word it will either converge to the right code word or it will keep on doing these oscillations back and forth back and forth it'll never converge okay so those are all interesting properties for this uh, for this decoder and you can't really analyze them in a very easy way so how it works right it's quite strange to analyze them. yeah so yeah exactly so you 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 will you will you will not have problems of wrong convergence with uh, these decoders well in practice you won't have and can i prove it maybe i can't prove it okay but in practice it's very unlikely that you will have it <coughs> stuff it's tough to calculate any other probability okay okay all right yeah by simulations you can check okay so okay so i i the next thing i want to do is go back to this uh, this uh, pl and ql things and just speak a little bit more about it i think i kind of rushed the whole threshold document uh, towards the end but uh, hopefully it's it's clear so, okay so pl was what we said pl is probability that a message message from a uh, bit to check node no bit to check equals 1 okay this was the probability uh, probability of er erroneous message from bit node to check node and we had a recursion for this we came up with the recursion okay some recursion which i'll call uh, l minus 1 and this recursion is parameterized by wr and wc right i'll put down wr and wc here just to be very specific okay <coughs> there were terms inside the recursion which involved wr and wc we in fact did it in two steps we went from pl to ql and then ql to pl plus 1 okay so that's how we did that and p0 is the same as the transition probability p okay so in fact you can even say this recursion is actually a function of pl minus 1 and p okay the reason is that each step p is also involved so you'll see right from when you went from ql to pl plus 1 p was also involved so if i have to write that properly this is a very nice and concise way of writing down that recursion okay so now when you study this function you have to study it as a function of two variables in pl minus 1 and p okay and there are a lot of interesting analytical properties for this function okay <clears throat> and what are its fixed points what are its uh, oh, is it mon monotonic with respect to one argument is it monotonic with respect to the other argument and all these properties are very interesting and there's lots of studies based on those things okay so I, i don't want to talk too much about it i'll simply i'll simply state some analytical properties of this function okay i, I won't i won't even state it i'll just say some properties 
uh, properties are important okay analytical properties such as monotonicity monotonicity with respect to p and pl minus 1 okay okay both of those are interesting <coughs> and then uh, uh, fixed points what is fixed point now yeah so fixed point would be pl will be equal to pl minus 1 <coughs> okay if you reach a point where the iteration basically converges right it doesn't go beyond that okay so yeah the derivative being equal to zero is also another way of looking at it okay so fixed points etc can be studied okay and there's lots of literature you'll see uh, there'll be lot there's lots of literature on these kind of things okay uh, no i mean for the for the function fixed point is pl equals pl not, not for the code or anything i'm just saying fixed point for the for this iterator iteration i'm just i'm just studying analytical properties of this function okay so you want to derive it you want to see if it's continuous you want to see if it's more, things like that okay analytical properties okay so fixed point fixed points are there is a connection between fixed points and thresholds which is again very interesting okay so then how do you define thresholds now so okay so I, the way i said that is for depending on p <coughs> okay so clearly if p equals 0 okay what is pl zero. pl converges to 0 and if p equals 1 what happens to pl okay, it will also be 1 right so those two you can check you can put it in that formula you can plug it into the formula you'll see if p is 0 it will be 0 if p is 1 it will always be 1 okay so from there you can argue since it's a monotonically decreasing sequence bounded away from 0 there will be a minimum value of p minimum or maximum yeah maximum value of p for which pl will still converge to 0 okay and that's how you define the threshold okay so let me write down how the threshold is defined okay p star is maximum p such that pl converges to 0 okay so in fact people don't use the mag word maximum here the reason is yeah you use supremum you don't you don't want the maximum to be in this set so if you do that then you can't define it properly you can always keep on going over and over so if you say supremum that's the right thing to say okay so anyway but if you don't if you're worried about it just just forget about it just say maximum that's good enough okay so <coughs> so you start with p equals 0 you keep on increasing p okay run this recursion see at what point you're getting the pl to converge to 0 till what point you're getting pl converging to 0 at one point you'll see sharply pl will converge to something non zero okay it will converge to something which is not zero at that point you declare that as your <coughs> threshold okay the smallest value at which that happens becomes your threshold <coughs> this is a proper way of uh, uh, defining thresholds one can do it see this recursion is not very difficult you can you can implement it in matlab in two lines right just a simple closed form expression you can implement it in two line and write a simple program to run this recursion quickly find thresholds for wr and wc okay like i said for 3 comma 6 the threshold is 0.04 okay for other things also you can do it okay so that's about the threshold any questions on how to compute this, this is clear right okay at least for the gallagher a algorithm this is clear okay yeah one can study that also so you can write the whole thing in terms of ql so instead of studying this recursion i can write for instance so he's saying instead of studying pl tending to zero why don't you study ql tending to zero both of them will happen together actually this is difficult to have one happening and the other not happening because if pl has gone to zero ql will become zero if ql is zero then pl plus one will become zero right the way we defined our iterations okay but but let me let me reiterate once again the ql iteration might be useful in some case Okay, because the form of the QL iteration is different from the form of the PL iteration. You write the whole iteration for PL in one way, you will see that whole expression is different from the expression for the QL iteration. Okay, in some cases that might be easier to optimize or study or anything. So for that reason you might study the QL iteration. <coughs> okay, so that's also equally important. You can write QL instead of PL also for this. Okay, so there's no sanctity for the bit to check message being one. You can even look at the other one. Okay, any other questions? on this
Okay, so the next crucial thing to understand is to understand this analysis in terms of the neighborhood. Okay, so that's one more piece of understanding which will give you more clarity about what's actually happening. Okay, I've been talking about this neighborhood and I've been associating this IID assumption to lack of repetition in the neighborhood or lack of cycles up to suitable depth in the in the original graph. Okay, so let's try to write down the neighborhood and associate this PL and QL to different stages of the neighborhood. So you'll see there'll be a natural association. Okay, so that's very important. Okay, so let's see that. Okay, so let me draw, draw, write down the neighborhood. Just, just the I'll, I'll call it the neighborhood view of Gallagher A. Okay, so you have the bit node. <coughs> okay, so this is this is one edge which is going from the bit node to some check node. Okay, then there will be other edges. How many edges will there be? W, C minus 1 of them. Okay, edges going to check nodes. From each check node, you will have W, R minus 1 edges going to bit nodes, right? Okay, so these guys will be W, R minus 1 okay so likewise the neighborhood will keep on going okay so this is this is a uh, depth 1 no this is depth 1 or depth 2 depth 2 okay so then you go to depth uh, 4 depth 3 you will get c minus 1 okay i know i'm drawing a very bad picture but maybe maybe you can improve this each of these things will be w c minus 1 again and then you have Okay, so the depth 4 neighborhood. So likewise you can keep on going and finally you will have the depth 2L neighborhoods ending up like this and even here you will have WR minus 4. Okay, so this is let us say depth 2L. Okay. Okay. So, so how am I going to think of Gallagher A decoding on this neighborhood? So for each bit, <coughs> okay, this is this is quite important. There's, there's lots of meaning in this. Okay, so for each bit, for for the bit on the top, okay, right? If for the bit on the top, if I form this depth 2L neighborhood, okay, and forget about the rest of the graph, okay. Can I say what will the message be from the bit node to that check node? Okay, so if I'm only interested in this message after two after L iterations, okay, I don't care about any other message. Okay, so suppose I isolate my view at one bit node, okay, and say the message that goes from that bit node on a particular edge, okay, I've, I've come to that point. Okay, I'm only interested in what happens to that at the Lth iteration. Is it enough to just have this neighborhood or do I need anything else? Okay, do you see why that is enough? Okay, right? Now I have a bunch of bit nodes here. In each of these bit nodes, okay, the last bit nodes at the very end, okay, those are called the leaf nodes of a tree, okay? The leaf nodes of this tree, okay, if I fill out all the received values, okay, <coughs> and then if I go through and fill out the received values in each and every bit node from there, I can completely figure out all the messages that are going to flow that will affect this final message that I have here. Okay? Are you able to visualize this? It's a little bit difficult to visualize. Okay? So, but this is this is reasonably crucial. Okay? <coughs> is there any confusion here or is there any sorry? Okay. So, 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 so. Okay. So, how do I? Uh, okay. So, <coughs> so the main objective is. Gallagher A decoding, the way we described it is, how did we describe it? We said, okay, bit to check messages are being passed, and check to bit messages are being passed. All of it is happening in parallel for all the bit nodes and all the check nodes, okay? Then we wanted to calculate the probability that one message from a bit node to a check node at iteration L was in error, okay? That's what we wanted to calculate, 
I did that very quietly by saying some IID assumption, etc., and all that, and everybody was happy. Okay, I'm not saying that's a bad thing. Okay, it's good that you believed me and you were happy. Okay, but if I have to properly do it, if I have to actually find the probability that a message from a bit node to check node at the lth iteration is an error, I have to actually backtrack from that edge, go back to the previous iteration, the previous iteration, previous iteration, figure out all the bit nodes that would have actually contributed to that message and then go through that and calculate it carefully okay that is the proper way of doing it right so that calculation will come only if you understand gallagher's decoding in terms of this neighborhood okay so maybe this whole depth 2l picture is too advanced to start with okay maybe we start with depth 2 picture okay just for the first iteration okay so suppose i say the bit to check node message in iteration 1 iteration 1 step a What are the only bits that are involved in this message? <coughs> Just that bit itself, right? Because this message itself is ri. Okay. Now, if I have to find the same mes the message on the same edge af after iteration in iteration two step a, what should I do? I have to look at the neighborhood of depth depth two. You see that? Okay. Because what would have happened? Okay. So this would have been connected to. Let me fix wr equals two. Uh, 3 okay this would have been connected to two other check nodes and each of those check nodes would have been connected to five other bit nodes okay so I'm, I'm drawing the neighborhood in slightly different way okay so if i know all the messages here all the received values here okay and the received value here for all the bit nodes okay then i can figure out what this message will be at iteration 2 Okay, you're not able to see this. Okay, so if I say ri here, okay, ri is the received value here for this bit. What is the message at iteration 2? I can't say it's ri. Obviously, it's not ri. I don't know ri. I need to know these messages and these messages. How will I find this message? Okay, I need to know what was passed before. Okay, so you have to go all the way up to a depth 2 neighborhood to figure out what message would have come here. For instance, if I say, uh, let's say, uh, let's say all these guys were 0. Okay. All the received values corresponding to all these bits were 0. Then what would have happened? What would have this message been? 0 again. And then I can say this will also be 0 according to Gallagher. Okay. Which check node? So which check node? This check node you mean? Why am I not worried about this check node? Because the way I designed my Gallagher A, I will never send back anything I receive from that check node. Okay, so that's crucial. So I don't have to worry about what happens beyond that check node. Because whatever came from there, I'm not going to use it when I send information back. Okay, so to figure out the message that is being sent in iteration 2 step A, I need to look at a depth 2 neighborhood of this bit node. Okay, okay. Now I can repeat the same thing. Suppose I say iteration 3 step A, what do I need? I have to again figure out what messages would have come before this. So I have to put one more check node here, one more layer here. Okay. Right. So, so it's the same, this picture I have generalized here. Okay. In the previous, in the previous, in the previous picture, that's what I have written down. Okay. Suppose I want to figure out the message that goes from a particular bit node on a particular edge i have to look at its depth l neighborhood okay like you said i don't have to worry about what happens to the neighborhood of the check node here this side i don't have to worry about on top of that i don't have to worry about only to the other side <coughs> i have to look at okay okay hopefully it's reasonably clear it requires some careful thought I mean, it's not very simple in the first place okay because because I've been, I've described the Gallagher algorithm. It's most easy to describe and analyze in this parallel fashion. When you isolate it to one bit node and see what are all, all the other bits involved, it's a little bit difficult to imagine that. Okay, but it's important. Okay, it's very important. Now, I want you to calculate something. Suppose I want to calculate the total number of bits that will be involved in the calculation of this message. Can you calculate that? All the bit nodes in this neighborhood. 
okay the total number of bit nodes in this neighborhood will be the neighbor the bits that were involved in the message from the bit node to the check node okay okay yeah up only two will no all these other bits will also be involved sir but those the explanation that is sent on that branch or on that service not depends on these no 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 it also depends on what was received there see if these two match then see you, it, that, that that can actually be ri right this message can be ri if these two don't match so obviously there is a crucial dependence on every bit node in the neighborhood not not only the leaf nodes see you start at the leaf nodes yeah in iteration 1 you start at the leaf nodes but then when you go into one of the intermediate bit nodes the value of that bit node could be the message that is sent because if these messages don't agree then you would send only the value of the, of the bit node right what is this message you go back and think about gallagher a how did we decide this message it's equal to ri if the messages don't agree okay so so ultimately when i do this calculation the total number of bit nodes that are involved in the in the computation of the message in the lth iteration from a bit node to a particular check node is a function of what and what it depends only on what and what wr and wc it does not depend on n okay okay so all these things are crucial arguments in the proofs and all that okay the number of bit nodes depend only on wr and wc and l of course of course l but it doesn't depend on n so i can tend n to a larger and larger number but what will be the same the number of bit nodes that are involved in the computation of message will be the same because it depends only on wr wc and l okay these are this is a fact that is used several times in many of the proofs of uh, ldpc codes convergence etc etc <coughs> okay sir there are no cycles yeah even for that you use properties like that. okay and this wr and wc are presumably small numbers compared to n and you can imagine this being very large okay that's the first thing that i want you to think about once more convince yourself that you understand this relationship between the neighborhood and gallagher decoding algorithm okay next thing i want you to do is i want you to put down p0 p1 p0 q0 p1 q1 etc on this neighborhood plot what is the prob where is the probability p0 going to show up what is the, the probability p0 is where which one is in error the rs at the leaf nodes okay what about q0 the one immediately above that do you see that okay so if you have it just here okay so this will this is where p0 will show up it's a probability that the message from the channel is an error okay these messages any of these messages are an error the probability that any of these messages are an error in error is q0 what about q1 the next stage or p1 next stage q1 next stage next stage okay do you see that okay so likewise as you keep going you will get this to be pl this will be ql l minus 1 etc okay this will be pl minus 1 etc <coughs> do you see that okay and all our calculations these iid assumptions everything are valid if none of these bit nodes repeat do you see that also okay if i make an all zero assumption and there is no repetition among any of these bit nodes up to depth 12 then i can assume iid right because there's no dependence they are all identically distributed okay so this is how you tie up this whole thing in a solid way to the neighborhood okay the so neighborhood plays a crucial role in deciding what the message is from at a particular iteration every iteration okay and only the neighborhood plays a role the other things don't play a role <coughs> okay whatever is outside of this neighborhood those bits do not affect my message at iteration L. okay only these bits affect okay so it's clearly suboptimal Okay, if you stop at a finite number of iterations, the iteration number is very small compared to the block length. There is every chance that your decoding will be suboptimal. Okay, you may not even use all the information that's out there. Well, it doesn't matter to you if it's good enough. Okay. So it's important to even associate this calculation, this analysis P0, Q0 to this neighborhood. Okay, what is P0? The probability that the leaf nodes, the message from the leaf nodes are in error. What's Q0? probability that from the check node to the next level is an error bit node to the next level is an error that's what we calculate 
okay i did that very quickly and quietly on the simple description okay nobody really asked me any deep questions at that point which is good again you should understand that first and then go and dig in here and understand this further okay the reason why this understanding is very crucial is eventually we will go to a situation okay the next thing we'll do is we'll move to a situation where we don't expect the graph to be regular okay so we will make it irregular okay what do i mean by irregular some nodes will have different degree some other nodes will have different degree okay then what will happen okay this neighborhood will change depending on which bit you look look at right if you have a regular code then the neighborhood remains the same irrespective of which bit you look at right looks the same the bits will be different but it will the structure will look the same the calculation for p0 q0 will hold for every bit in the exact same way okay right remember p0 q0 what was involved in the calculation wr and wc why why is all that valid because this thing looks exactly the same for each bit okay when i go to irregular structures for my tana graph the first confusion will be the neighborhoods are not the same okay so then how do you do this analysis okay so all those questions will come up at that point you'll have to do some further approximations and concentrations and all that okay so we'll do all that to visualize all that very clearly and see exactly what's happening you need to keep this picture in mind you should also keep the previous picture in mind just do some iid assumption and then do the computation in a very simple way okay so we'll have to do both of those okay so all right is this clear any any other question lingering doubts about this neighborhood and how it plays in it's okay okay the next thing i want to comment upon is the all zero assumption okay so <coughs> why is the all zero assumption true okay okay what am i actually doing when i do the all zero code word assumption okay so what i need to actually compute is probability that c cap is not equal to c okay this is what i am interested in computing this is my probability of error what what i could do is sum over all codes in c all code words in c my transmitted code word probability that c cap is not equal to u given c equals u times probability that c equals u okay i'm going to condition it on each individual code word find the probability that you have an error given that that code word was transmitted then sum it over all those cases okay i'm going to assume all code words are equally likely a priori so what will be this value 1 by 2 power k okay so that that's clear okay but what about these guys why should they be <coughs> all equal okay suppose i say no let me rephrase let me slow down a little bit suppose i say this expression is independent of u it's equal for all u okay then what happens i can even pull that out and say this whole expression will simply become probability that c cap is not equal to u given c equals u for any u for any one u i compute this then that will be equal to the entire probability okay so what's a good u that you can choose that you'll know will be in all zero all zero okay so what do you need to make the all zero code word assumption in your calculation all these probabilities given that a particular code word is transmitted have to be the same okay <coughs> there are one needs to prove this okay right remember what are we doing in the decoder we are doing something something which is not necessarily the same for each received code word right if you if you receive a code transmit a code word the actual messages will differ okay some things might be one some things might be zero everything will change okay so one needs to carefully prove it okay so 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 the the, the trick to proving this is to show to show that if you transmit any code word u okay and then you face an error vector e it's the same as transmitting zero with the error vector e and then you can map these two decoders one to one okay so that's what people do people show if you transmit u and face a particular error vector okay it's the same as transmitting zero and facing maybe some other error vector i believe it's the same error vector so you have a one to one correspondence between a decoder for a code word u and the decoder for the all zero code word they run exactly the same way exactly the same way in the sense if you have a erroneous message in one decoder the exact same message will be erroneous in this other decoder for the all zero code word okay so you do that mapping and then you show 
it works okay that needs to be done it needs proof okay but we will not see that proof in class for uh, uh, will not I, I will not do that proof in class but i'll just say that it's possible to show it okay a crucial necessity for this is symmetry of the channel okay usually you need the channel to be symmetric okay the decoder should also satisfy some conditions on top of that the channel should be symmetric symmetric in the sense what channel should do the same thing to both 0 and 1 okay for the bsc is a very classic nice symmetric channel it doesn't do anything very different to uh, 0 or 1 so it works out okay so channel symmetry helps in this proof the decoder operation is also important and uh, and one can do that okay so by the way if you want rigorous proofs for many of these statements there is one central reference it's a book called modern coding theory okay i believe at this point it's available for free download from uh, rudiger or bankes website this book was written by it's being written i believe by rudiger or banke and thomas richardson do you remember these names okay i mentioned these names before okay you can do a google search you will find it from uh, rudiger or banke's website okay but it's a difficult book to read as in it's, it's very rigorous and proper and they've done a, done a lot of careful study but if, if all these missing proofs that i keep saying that I'm, i will not do this proof you can go to this book and look at the proofs okay it's a very uh, all the detailed proofs are available available there okay and <clears throat> go back and check and convince yourself that the all zero code word assumption was very crucial for us in the simplification of the density evolution otherwise you'll be stuck with some messages uh, being see we, we could happily say probability of error is the same as probability that ul is one okay if i didn't know the message was all zero i'll have to be careful it will depend on the actual bit and then i have to do all kinds of calculation it'll be the same it won't change too much you can show it will be the same but it, but the calculation the computation becomes much easier if you do okay probability of error vector being what oh looking at the error vector instead of looking at the thing itself so. mm, yeah maybe yeah maybe 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 so it's it's a little bit more tricky than that go go and look at the proof i mean you have to be careful with the steps of the steps of your decoder okay you should not see the steps of the decoder should not depend on what exactly u was i mean the code word was right so sometimes it's not very clear that the way we described it it doesn't depend on that when you're saying the steps of the decoder should only depend on e yeah, yeah i agree with you when you do a syndrome decoder first thing you do is h times r transpose which becomes h times e transpose so anything you do is only dependent on the error vector so you can happily assume all zero and do all these things you have to show that the steps of your decoder are getting rid of the syndrome how getting rid of u and are operating only on the error vector it's not clear because you're not directly computing all the parity checks you're doing only partial parity checks right you're doing right you remember the message from the check node to the bit node this not it's not the full parity check right it's parity check xord with one of the things so you don't know a priori if you are only dealing with the error vector or the code word itself is involved so you need to prove that that's all okay all right so we'll stop here for today in the next class we'll pick up from here and continue so forth